So glad you could join me today for Understanding the Times Radio. I have a special guest with me. I'm going to bring him on momentarily. His name is Wilfred Hahn. You just heard him in that little clip. And by the way, that introductory clip, he closed that short statement saying, Satan must coordinate the world to do his will, and he will use the love of money, and that is well underway. I thought that was very profound. Wilfred Hahn is a global economist, strategist, formerly top-ranked global analyst, research director for a major Wall Street investment bank and head of Canada's largest global investment operation. In his writings, focus on end-time roles of money, economics, and globalization. And by the way, the actions of the globalists and their efforts at control, along with the lack of a world leader, including in America's capital, has caused financial instability on every continent. We're going to talk about that this hour. How does the Christian navigate these unstable economic times? So I am back to Terry James' very intriguing book that we're carrying, and that would be Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. Wilfred Hahn has a chapter in this book, and it's titled Tribulation Tempest, End Time Money Entrapment. So we're going to look at various money and economy-related issues for the next hour. And we have talked for a year on this program about the coming digital currency. We've talked about central bank digital currency frequently. How safe are our banks? Why is the stock market seemingly so resilient? Can't people see that there are very rough waters ahead? Now, many commentators are now saying that the conflict between Ukraine and Russia will certainly escalate and cause even more global instability. And I think that's possible. We may be looking at World War III, I hate to say that, but almost every commentator is saying the same with a very troubled voice. Global conflict causes financial instability. So I'd like to welcome back to the programming of Understanding the Times Radio, Wilfred Hahn. Welcome back. Thank you, Jen, for inviting me to your program. You were with me almost 20 years ago, so times have changed in 20 years. I'm taking a lot of my comments, again, from the chapter you wrote in this particular book, Wilfred, we read in Revelation about the black horse, that there will be an economic chaos time during the seven-year tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, when a day's wages for a loaf of bread are going to be needed. And we're seeing shades of that today. Give me your thoughts on this, because where do you see this going? I'm talking now pre-rapture. There's many, many indicators in the Bible that we can link up with present-day developments. They're sort of preparatory trends for all the events that happen in the tribulation period, many of those. For example, you referenced just inflation. Inflation is prophesied to be a problem inside the tribulation. But beforehand, what do we see developing? Well, we see a lot of trends and policies put in place around the world that ultimately will ignite inflationary trends. Where I see it kind of linking in is with population dynamics. The world is going through a phenomenal change in value that has to do with families and children. Because of that, I mean, this has already been in tow for 50, 60 years, slowing population growth for one. What that must cause is a group, an uh, older cohort of people, and they're all going to be wanting to clamor after retirement income of some kind, but there aren't that many workers anymore that are younger that can support that whole structure. So all of that is one of the ingredients that will contribute to quite a bit of inflation. Policymakers do see these problems and they have to come up with solutions. Unfortunately, a lot of these solutions are bogus and won't last very long. But in the meantime, they know that they have to keep the apparition, the picture going, just to keep everybody convinced and engaged in the trends that are going on. So I just mentioned briefly here on inflation, we can give it a much more prominent treatise, if you like. But there's all kinds of things in the Bible that refer to globalization trends, globalism. And, of course, the very fact that Satan must promote systems and technology that allow him to be omnipresent. In effect, he isn't. But through these mechanisms, it allows him then to bring about some of these trends. And the most viable way of doing that, you already quoted it, Jan. I'll just read a quick sentence here to under note that there's no more powerful worldwide earthly control mechanism possible of humans than an integrated cashless financial system. So that's what has to be put in place, and we're well along the way. 
I actually want to go there, and I have talked about central bank digital currency on this program frequently. We know that the government would like to get rid of cash and be able to track and tax every single transaction on the planet, which they will be able to do with CBDC. I was telling my audience a year, maybe even more than a year ago, to start paying attention to the term CBDC, central bank digital currency. I think what I'd like to do, since we got into this particular subject, CBDC, a little bit sooner than I thought, is just play a real quick clip. It happens to be Tucker Carlson and Catherine Austin Fitz. They're going to discuss this for a little over three minutes, and then I want to come back and talk about it with you. Take away cash and make everything digital, and digital currency is central bank digital currency. Obviously, you have no power whatsoever. If they don't like what you're doing, they just shut you down and you're impoverished. It just happened in Canada last winter, so we know what the consequences are. We know why they want it. So that couldn't happen, right? Well, we may live to see the day that it does happen. And here's the latest sign that it may be happening. The number of banks and ATM machines in this country are in steep decline, far fewer than there were just a few years ago. And in some countries like Australia, they're going away at high speed. So this is not something that anyone voted on. This is something that they're just doing, whether you like it or not. So you can say we have cash, but if you can't get cash, then do you really have cash? So where is this going? That's the question we want to assess tonight. And we're going to with Catherine Austin Fitz, who has been monitoring this. She founded the Solari Report. She's also the Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and we're happy to have her. Catherine, thanks for coming on. So I think if you put this up to a vote nationally, most people would say, no, you know, I may not use cash, but I'd like to have cash because if there's no cash, then I have no control over my life. But it seems like this could be a way to affect the same outcome without a vote. So, Tucker, the, the, one of the bedrocks of freedom is freedom to do financial transactions, including privately, or freedom to do where you want to do and wherever you want to do. And unfortunately, as the financial system has become more and more digital, you see more and more not only invasive surveillance, but more and more controls. You referred to Canada, perfect example. And the reality, as the financial system gets more controlling and more invasive, it's a little bit like bringing up a corral around us. And CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, and vaccine passports or digital IDs are sort of the last uh, shutting of the gate. It's hard for many people to imagine the risks here because we're so used to living with financial transaction freedom. And we don't understand that when this gate closes on us, we literally will be sitting in a system where the central banks believe that our assets belong to them and they can dictate where we can spend money and what we can spend money on. Um, the important thing to understand is central bank digital currencies are not currencies. It's a financial transaction control grid, and it gives the ability for the central bankers, and they've said this publicly, the ability to not only set, set the rules centrally, but enforce the rules centrally. If you don't behave, you can have your money turned off. You, know, you, you keep hearing people on television say cash is for criminals. Why would you need cash if you're not doing something <laughs> bad? Why are so few financial journalists pointing out that actually if cash goes away, so does any power you might have had over your own life? Well, I, I find a lot more journalists are beginning to understand and are beginning to not only write about this and talk about this, but do documentaries. We just had a new documentary done here out of the Netherlands called State of Control, which does a great job of explaining the invasive nature of this control grid. Um, I think... It's very hard for people who've grown up and enjoyed Western liberty and, and human liberty to imagine literally that we're going into a system where literally our homes, our cars, our communities become digital concentration camps. So if you've enjoyed liberty, it's very hard to, you know, perceive this iceberg before you hit it. And that's why it's so important, and I commend you for, for talking about CBDCs, because we need to not let the proper— uh, propaganda persuade us that, one, this is convenient, or two, that we need this, or three, we need to understand the not only the dangers of CBDCs, but the opportunities if we start to reverse financial tyranny. You are listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. If you join me late, I have on the line from Canada, Wilfred Hahn, global economist and strategist. 
Wilfred, we're trending towards the tribulation again. Tribulation will be cashless. Speak into this CBDC issue, would you please? The very definitely agreed with everything that was said there. The difficulty with some of these appraisals of technology, let's say, is to differentiate the technology from the application. I've written on this topic quite a number of times. The thing about technology is it's a one-way development. As soon as the technology attains another niveau, it never goes backwards. It boils down always in adopting these technologies if you want to trade off a vulnerability for a benefit, something that's convenient. That word was used also. So when I look at these digital currencies, I definitely see the advantages. There's advantages for consumers, big advantages for centralized governments and such. To be honest about it, it's convenient, and that's why it'll also be successfully promoted to the rest of the population. One of the key phrases that either Tucker Carlson or Catherine Austin Fitz said very bluntly and very appropriately, if you don't behave, your money is turned off. That's what's coming. We don't know if that's coming here in the coming weeks, months, if it's pre-tribulation, during the tribulation. I think it very well could be pre-tribulation, don't you? You may be right. I'm not quite sure exactly what the final timing will be. We know inside the tribulation period that we're going to get a lot of challenges for policymakers. Those are pretty bad times, and they have to come up with solutions. And that's one of the things I think that many observers look, is that we're not the only ones that are observing these problems. Policymakers see them as well. They, therefore, can concoct up new techniques, programs, and what have you to try to overcome those. For example, just what we've been through here with the COVID situation, trillions of dollars have been thrown at it. And we can't even tell you how much of it is when you include the direct fiscal spending and all the rest of it. But that was because policymakers saw the need. They interpreted it to be a need and to address it the way that they did. Back to my discussion about what happens inside the tribulation if we get that black period. They have to come up with policies to continue to allow the world to eke by. Maybe that's how it happens inside. And then the responses that we get from policymakers then leads to the inflation, the exacerbation of inflation. I wanted to comment on inflation here just a moment because we were talking inflation as we opened the program. Looking at a headline, it's on Breitbart. Biden's inflation is crushing the middle class. And I think the question is, how high is it going to go in 2023? And the author says, at least I'm not in the market for a new car, something most Americans look forward to, but which is increasingly out of reach for millions. It goes on to say, Fortune reported last week that new cars are now toys for the rich. My goodness as the average price for a new vehicle in the U.S. has jumped to an amount here. It's staggering, and I'm sure it depends on what kind of a model you buy, but it can be easily $50,000 for a new car. And then it goes on to say what we're going to put into the automobile. Did you want to fill that up? Gas prices are primed to rise again in a few weeks. They're already on the way up in the West, which is where this author lives. Here in Colorado, the average price for a gallon of regular is back to over $4 and briefly dipping to around $3 in 2022. And then they say Californians are closing in on $5 again. Somehow, though, a gallon of gas in California is still less than a dozen eggs. Okay, well, a lot was said in those couple of paragraphs. And again, I think the question is, how high is this going to go? Some of this is staggering for my listeners. And I have another article here. About two-thirds of the country, Wolfred Hahn, are living paycheck to paycheck. Yes, the situation we're living in right now is quite terrible. It's brutal when you think of it from a retiree's point of view. Yes. Fixed income. They may have portfolios that have interest income accruing to them. But when you have those rates at 3% and inflation is running along at 6% for a period of time, well, you're going backwards. So that's what we're in right now. Not a whole lot we can do about it. We know the policymakers, certainly the U.S. Fed, is wanting to stamp out the inflationary juices, so to speak. Not so much successful just yet, but most certainly their talk is pretty direct. In other words, they intend to get inflation back down to at least to the 2% level. I don't know how fast that's going to take, but they're definitely trying to do that. So I don't see necessarily a big grand inflation uptrend happening from here. We've already had one over the last year and a half. Pretty astounding, really. Yes. How quickly everybody, for example, corporations, I'm not against corporations, of course, per se. I'm just against what some of them may do. And they were very quick to jack up prices and bolster their earnings. Now, that's kind of coming to the end right now, but it happened very quickly on many levels. That's kind of an interesting statement on the behavior of human beings. Again, Wilfred Hahn has a chapter in the book that's found in my online store, Trajectory. 
Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. This chapter is titled Tribulation Tempest, End Time Money Entrapment. I'm going to play a real quick clip here. It happens to be Dr. Mark Hitchcock talking again about this topic. I don't want to let go of because it's so important. It's in our future. Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDC. There's an article or a headline that came out in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago that says central bank digital currencies are coming, whether countries are ready or not. And then the, the subheading said the development could have a profound impact on the banking system, but few people understand it. And I think that's an understatement there that few people understand this. I think very few people understand the implications of what's coming. Uh, just a little background about this, 114 countries are exploring digital currencies. So this isn't some kind of marginal idea. This is 114 nations are in various stages of either exploring or implementing uh, these central bank digital currencies. These 114 countries represent 95% uh, of the global uh, uh, gross domestic product. So basically it pretty much covers all the main nations in the world. Now, there, there are advantages to these central bank digital currencies that are often, often touted. They'll say, well, this is going to help with uh, prevent money laundering. It's going to reduce fraud, um, counterfeiting, um, all kinds of terrorist financing, drug trafficking. There's all kinds of, of, of ways this will, will help. I mean, even probably with disease and pandemics, because you know, a lot of disease is spread by you know, money that, that's transferred uh, for, from one hand to another. But these, these central bank digital currencies, as many advantages as there are, there's some, some incredible disadvantages to this and, and major problems with this. Now, again, just a little bit more background. 17 countries, including Russia and China, are currently pilot, piloting a central bank digital currency. So it's not been fully adopted, but they have a pilot project. 11 nations are developing one. Uh, such as the United States and Japan, which, which Japan has announced uh, just uh, this week that its central bank digital currently currency pilot program is going to launch in April of this year. But it's also something that is hitting home here in America. Um, th this has really been in the works in America since 2017. Um, President Biden signed an executive order. It's Executive Order 14067 on March 9th of, of 2022, about a year ago. So this is the wave of the future in, in, in the economy. Now, I think this fits in dramatically with, with the prophetic picture of the end times, because I think in the, in the third seal judgment, the, the rider on the black horse, it starts out the rider, the white horse, the antichrist, the rider on the red horse is, is warfare that begins to break out. And then in the, in the wake of warfare is going to be basically a global economic implosion during the tribulation period. Uh, it's going to be an all-out implosion. It, it's going to be hyperinflation. It's going to take everything a person can earn just to buy enough uh, cheap food uh, to eat. You can read about it there in, in, in Revelation chapter 6, the rider on the black horse. So it's going to be a global financial apocalypse. And I think out of that, the Antichrist will rise as the global economic savior. And he's going to institute eventually a global economic system. He's going to rule the world economically. Ultimately, he'll rule the world religiously and uh, politically and militarily in Revelation 13. But I think his entree is going to initially be in, in the, the, the area of the economy. That's the easiest way to gain control. And I don't think there'll have to be a global currency. If you have these, the, these central bank digital currencies in place, if you can get control of this, then you can control all of these currencies and basically control uh, the world economy. So I think economic control in the wake of that, that global economic implosion with the third seal will be the first phase of the Antichrist uh, global, global takeover. And when that happens, then ultimately he'll institute the mark of the beast. No one can buy or sell without his mark. He'll have total control of the world economy. And the only way you can have that is some kind of cashless system, just like this central bank uh, digital currency system that's being established. You know, Wilfred, one thing I find interesting is that the stock market seems fairly resilient and it seems to be going up and down, but do you anticipate, and I know a lot of my listeners are wondering, and they're wondering in light of, should they be investing? Where do you think that's going to go here in the coming year? I have an article here in front of me, and it is from Fox News. Actually, it was just a week ago. This was headline news on Fox. 
U.S. stocks are in a death zone and could sink 26%. Morgan Stanley warns, this is one paragraph, U.S. stocks have climbed to unsustainable highs and face imminent losses once investors realize there will be no Federal Reserve pivot later this year, according to Morgan Stanley. It goes on to say, so-and-so of the chief U.S. equity strategist at Morgan Stanley Warn in an analyst note this week that the stock market has entered a level known as the death zone, the name used in mountaineering to describe an altitude so high that climbers do not have enough oxygen to breathe. I'll stop there. I would like your input. My listeners would appreciate it as well. The various clips that you quoted there, Jan, that's normal. That's just the day in day drumbeat of Wall Street and its cistern around the world. It's always a standoff between what they call the bulls and the bears. And go back to a point I made before, that policymakers see these difficulties as well and try to bring in policies that will avert some of the disasters that are being predicted. And if you look back over the years, it is a natural human state that markets fluctuate. You've got 8 billion people out there looking to make a gain. Not everybody participates in that, of course. That's just normal, that kind of interplay. I'll just mention this as well. Forecasting out is extremely difficult, as everybody knows, particularly short term. One year is very short term. Longer term, a five, 10 year type period is a little more reasonable, I think, in terms of managing expectations. It is terrible. Most people feel exasperated. They don't know what's going on, and it's a hard time figuring out what the answers are. Just a heads up here for those of you wishing to consult with Wilfred Hahn on investing. I have to tell you, due to Canadian restrictions and regulations, that's probably not going to be possible. I'm really beginning to wonder if Canada is an open and free society anymore. I'm hearing from Canadians regularly, but you will not be able to consult with Mr. Hahn on investments. And Wilfred, I get, I would like to say daily, certainly three, four times a week, questions from my followers and listeners wondering what on earth they should be doing with their finances at this point in time in history. As I said in my opening to the program, we have potential war in at least Eastern Europe, which could easily spread to the Middle East, and it could become World War III. And that's not the purpose of this hour, other than situations like that cause such gross instability all around the world, and then gross instability in the lives of each and every person listening to this program. So do you have a word of wisdom for somebody listening right now and they're just wondering what on earth do they do? Are you recommending at all, for instance, gold, silver commodities? Are you recommending mainly go into the market, stay out of the market? Give me your thoughts here before I go into a midpoint break. The interplay of human behavior and psychology with markets is an important thing to observe. When the vast majority are pessimistic, concerned, worried, then asset prices tend to be lower, cheaper. That's sort of a natural process when you don't know what's going on and there's a lot of bad news. And most people unfortunately do the wrong thing at the wrong time is they jump out. And that's one of the concerns I really have with what I call the doomster merchants is that their advice is very good at getting people out and not necessarily at the right time. That's harder to say, but virtually absent when to tell clients to get back in. That's really tough. And so what happens, unfortunately, and that's the case in America, most certainly in Canada also, is that the average individual investing out there does a really poor job. They end up, on average, making returns less than a CD rate. Now, that's data that I have that goes back 20 to 50 years. And that's simply because they're being jostled around with all this bad news, potential bad news, bad forecasts, but they're responding to it emotionally. That's the difference between professional money managers, and I would say, I don't like to use the word retail investors, but individual investors would be a better word. I would just caution with that. If you look back through history, let's say just look back 100 years, there's crisis after crisis after war, and markets go up and down, but we're still here. The markets are still here. The markets are a lot higher than they were 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You can see how this process does perpetuate itself, but in the process does buck off a lot of people and just have a lot of people confused. Quick answer, I'm sorry that went a little long, That's but you right. need to take a basic non-emotional approach and stay diversified. That's the best I can put into words. Are you in favor of investing in gold, silver, and commodities? Yeah, we do that as part of a global balanced portfolio, in my particular case. I'm a global fund manager, 
we try to incorporate as much as we can more diversification. And from time to time, gold will be on there. Gold, there's good times to buy gold and there's some good times to sell it. So I'm not necessarily a holder in the sense that I think gold is money. I don't think gold is money anymore, but it is a good buy from time to time. I'm going to read a paragraph or two from your chapter in the book, Trajectory. I think I will wait and do that in part two of my programming. And I also want to talk just briefly, because you write about it, the prosperity gospel. And I'm actually going to play a clip of some prosperity gospel people, and then somebody who's going to critique what they have just talked about with their prosperity lingo. Because I personally feel that, I mean, I would guess 20% of the church is infected with the prosperity gospel, and that's because there is an end-time money snare, and you write about that a great deal, and you write about the prosperity gospel in this chapter, in Trajectory. And I think this is one of the saddest things that has hit the church in the last 50 to 60 years, and I know they probably go back to the turn of the last century, but then they picked up steam probably some 40, 50 years ago, and we could get into naming names. I'm not going to do that, though this little clip will talk about some of those, a couple of people anyway. So I want to do that in part two of my programming. And then I want to get into a few more practical issues and practical questions for you. For instance, credit card balances, they're increasing at the fastest pace in U.S. history. Quite frankly, U.S. household debt reached an all-time record of $17 trillion here in the last quarter. That is staggering. And many of my listeners, I know you are caught in this trap, and that is a terrible, terrible trap to get into. It has terrible consequences. We'll talk about that and much more in part two of my programming, and I'm going to open part two by talking about the terrible snare of the prosperity theology, and that has infected, I would say, 20 to 25 percent of our churches, and it has serious consequences. More in a moment. Don't go away. Hey, I'm very concerned about the future. Uh, you know, I've been at this um, since 1980, and I've never seen a decline that we're looking at now. You know, one of the trends that we're forecasting, you go back to our Trends Journal magazine on February 22nd, 2022, two days before the Ukraine war started. And the magazine headline read, From COVID War to Ukraine War to World War. Uh, World War III's begun. Uh, they, they, um, they say it's a proxy war between NATO and the United States. It's not a proxy war, they're at war. The United States has sent in over a hundred billion dollars of aid and weapons to Ukraine since this broke out. This is a country in the United States where 63% of the people are living paycheck to paycheck. And they just sent over a hundred billion dollars over there. This is a country where they just passed a defense budget of about $860 billion as the homeless situation in a city near you just keeps getting worse. I kind of agree with Gerald Salente that things absolutely do not make sense today, at least when it comes to finances. And that's why I was drawn to the trajectory book, but then to Wolfred Hahn's chapter that he has written on our finances today, Tribulation Tempest, The End Time Money Entrapment. Let me quickly say, before we get back into the discussion, we have an Understanding the Times one-night conference coming up Thursday, March 16th, here in the Twin Cities, and we live stream these to the world. That will be Thursday, March 16th, 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time. Our guest for the evening is Pastor Tom Hughes. You can live stream it at MarkHenryMinistries.com. You can live stream it on the Olive Tree app. You can find it post-program at OliveTreeViews.org and then to video. And if you want to attend, the location is Revive Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, suburb of Minneapolis, 7849 West Broadway, Brooklyn Park. Plenty of seats, Thursday, March 16th. Live stream MarkHenryMinistries.com or use the Olive Tree Ministries app. 
Pastor Tom Hughes, co-hosts Mark Henry, yours truly. We will talk about a number of current event issues, prophecy-related issues that evening for one and a half to two hours. We'll provide a DVD of it about a week later. Again, you can watch it live. You can watch it on our website. We have an app here at Olive Tree Ministries. It's available in the App Store for Apple and the Play Store for Android. Look for the Olive Tree Ministries logo. It will provide easy access to so much. Our radio programs, you can live stream the events. You can go straight to our social media. You can go straight to our headlines, etc. It is just a wonderful little tool. Now, let me get back to our discussion. And I have Wilfred Hahn with me again. Wilfred is a global economist and strategist, formerly a top-ranked global analyst, research director for a major Wall Street investment bank head of Canada's largest global investment operation. His writings focus on the end-time roles of money, economics, and globalization. And you've heard me talk about globalization endlessly on the program. I wanted to keep my word here and hit this prosperity theology for just a moment, because you write about it. And let me just read a paragraph. This is in the chapter, folks. You say this, and I couldn't agree with you more. Many, if not all to some degree, have been lured by prosperity theology, a malignant corruption. People living in wealthy countries, such as the U.S. and Canada, have their minds thoroughly riddled with non-biblical bias. It is a key reason most Christians are blind to the end-time strategies of the conspirator or Satan. It creates a false, one-sided perspective on money. As we will show, you go on to say this, You say, briefly describe prosperity theology, says material prosperity is the right of all Christians and moreover serves as proof positive of being blessed by God. We are all to believe that so-called Christians will be materially rewarded for their faith and obedience. This reward is to accrue in the physical dimension of the here and now upon earth. First, I want to ask you why you included this information in your chapter on Tribulation Tempest. Then I want to follow it with a short soundbite, but go ahead, please. Number one, it all obfuscates some of the big major trends that Christians should be aware of and that they actually realize that. It promotes a materialistic perspective. I want to use also the example of the temptation of Christ. Satan at that time promised him, or at least offered him, kingdoms. And the Bible did not argue with the fact that Satan does have the power to do that. So the question next is, if you're getting blessed, who is blessing you? Can you distinguish between Satan giving you money to do what he wants? Or is it a true gift from God? Or did you just earn it? So just to distinguish on those points, I would say that's difficult enough right there. Satan certainly uses wealth to entice people to do his will. That happens on the micro level, individual level, and then also on the big strategic geopolitical levels. In Daniel 11.39, it talks about elites being paid off with land and things like that. Those that honor Satan. There's a blatant example of money being used Mm. by Satan to foment things that he wants on this earth. I think part of this gets all muddled together. So how do you know that you're being blessed by Satan or not? Some people sadly to say, really shouldn't come into a lot of money because they can never handle it. Others maybe have better means of handling it. It's not necessarily, to have big gobs of money and the excess of what you need is not necessarily a blessing to some people. You say tragically, hardly any pulpits have not been influenced by the infectious disease of the prosperity theology in one way or another, blatantly or subtly. I'm going to play a clip because it includes three people who are obviously and blatantly prosperity preachers, followed by someone who's going to chastise them. That would be Justin Peters. But you're about to be blessed like you've never been blessed before. And some of you need to step into blessing. And you do that with an act of faith. $300. Why is that significant? It's significant, number one, because it got your attention. And it's significant, number two, because that's what the prophet of God spoke. You say, but I may not have $300 right now. Well, what do you have? Do you have a hundred? Do you have a hundred and fifty? Take a step of faith toward God right now. But everyone who wants to move to greatness, listen to the voice of God, $300. Release it to God and watch 
greatness come. Because God is a God of abundance. God is a God of abundance, but you'll never experience it until you're fully persuaded that God wants to prosper you. If you can believe, he's going to make a way for those kids to go to college. He's going to make a way. That's why I feel so passionate about this stuff. It works for people who take hold of the promises. Hallelujah. Do I believe that God wants to bless us? Yes. But when you go to the conferences, you ask people to give money. So sure. you, you say, do it cheerfully. Yep. Because... Because the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. See, giving is a major part of the whole Christian doctrine. But do you believe that if someone gives money to the ministries, right. that more will come back to them? Yes. Absolutely. I and think that's what they mean by prosperity gospel. Yes. No, but do you worry at all that, that sometimes your message will be heard by someone in the most dire circumstances? This is sort of roulette wheel a sort of gamble with God. Okay, well, I can't pay the rent, but I'll give it to Joyce and we'll see what happens. Do you worry at all that well, that I, happens? I totally know I don't worry about that. Joyce Meyer says, I, no, to I totally don't worry about that. Well, I'm sure she doesn't, but she should. Because right now, even as we speak, there are thousands of people all around the world who are watching TBN and Daystar and Lasea Broadcasting and the Word Network and all these things. And they are hearing this endless drivel of saying, you send us your money and God will give you a harvest. And there are people at home, they are poor, they are sick, they are desperate, they have sick children. And so in desperation, they get out their checkbook or they get out their credit card and they send in money to these multi-millionaire preachers who fly in private jets and who live in multi-million dollar homes. Jesse Duplantis, for example, lives in a 35,000 square foot parsonage. But when your wealth is gained off of preying upon the hopes and fears of hurting and sick and desperate people, there's a lot wrong with that. When your wealth is gained off of distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a lot wrong with that. Wilfred, I think that says it all. So I'm glad you included a little bit of this in your chapter here in Trajectory. Did you want to comment on the clip displayed? I totally agree. The curious thing, of course, isn't it, that one has so many believers in prosperity theory here in North America and other prosperous nations, and in the poorer nations, you don't. I've never been able to figure out why. Probably well, because they're a little more sensible about where money comes from. But that's interesting. The one little telltale that works every time as to whether or not somebody's offering you real help or a Christian perspective is if there's an exchange of money. The Bible gives salvation freely. It's specific about that. And all these other solutions being offered are offered at a cost of money. And that's probably the number. That in itself is an indicator that it's a false good that you're being asked to pay for. I agree with you. You highlight in your writings that this is prominent, the prosperity theology, as you just said, in rich nations, not in poor nations. But the problem is, Wilfred Hahn, is that these prosperity preachers are preying on people in the poorer nations, telling them that they can become rich. I'm talking about very poor nations. And then they add insult to injury by saying that if you'll give even more, you're going to be double blessed. In other words, it mushrooms in insanity as they push this agenda even further and the seed faith and all of that, which again, it's occupying at least one fourth of our churches and maybe a third of our churches now. And I find this is part of probably the end time apostasy or falling away that was predicted. This is certainly a part of that. But I appreciate your calling it out anyway. Unless you wanted to say more, I'm going to move on. This isn't an hour on the prosperity theology, but folks, we're talking money, and money is abused in that stream of theology. I'm quoting you here, and you say this, Conveniently, crises can serve as a clandestine cover under which to push forward a long-term agenda against God. You say, for example, mankind is very vulnerable to fear and greed. Satan knows this well. He therefore surely loves hyperactive financial markets around the world. He ruthlessly uses these human penchants and weaknesses to his advantage. And then you write, it is therefore reasonable to accept that crises and their attendant human responses of fear and panic do play into the glove of those who have an agenda to advance. 
They can seize the opportunity of a populace that is willing to compromise or accept a loss of freedom for the sake of security and prosperity. And then you conclude this particular thought anyway. These trade-offs lead down a very treacherous road, one that is well documented throughout history and also in the Bible. And you say, why? Because such changes and trends born of crises are usually cumulative and not easily reversed. I'm going to ask you, do you feel that some of the financial crises today then fall in this category? I mean, clearly there's some are Satan manipulated, but a lot of things, if people sense a crisis, they do strange things with their money. Perhaps is that the point being made? Yeah. Again, emotions and behaviors that are not paying attention to the facts. If you're losing money, people get pretty emotional about that pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And that gets their attention. We're still to expect some more of that. In the future, for example, we talked earlier about the one world money system and the anti-money snare, how that's going to be coming about. But what still stands in the way is the sovereignty of a number of nations around the world. We have a good coming together on technology, central banking theory, the overall views on that sort of thing seem to be coming about, but nobody wants to give up sovereignty for their nation. How do you shake that loose? Well, progressively that's already happened, but you shake that loose with more crises and they may be short-term crises, were enough to generate fears on the parts of policymakers to come up with new solutions. But again, it comes back to the difference between enjoying a new benefit and trading it for vulnerability going forward. That's unfortunately the standby that happens in every one of these situations. We get more vulnerable to these systems. And all of these trends, we just talked on a few of them, do have a cumulative effect on the world's economic structure. We've just gone through COVID and the various big support programs and so forth. Yes, it helped some people who were without a job perhaps and needed supplementary income and that sort of thing. Let me move on to some practical questions that I have for you. Again, I'm speaking okay. for the hour with Wilfred Hahn. For those of you wishing to consult with Wilfred Hahn on investing, I have to tell you, due to Canadian restrictions and regulations, you will not be able to consult with Mr. Hahn Forgive me for being a little bit America-centric here. I'm not asking you to comment a whole lot on Canada for a couple of reasons we don't even have to discuss, but do you have any insight on the stability of U.S. banks? And I think there's plenty of speculation that they're not very stable. In fact, they're closing down at a record pace. Can you speak into this, please? While you refer directly to U.S. banks, they are also amongst the largest banks in the world. And we've already seen some developments here over the last crises, the number of crises, for example, the global financial crisis. What happened then is this is another one of these examples of how a crisis prods development on a new front. And that's what happened 14 or 15 years ago. The BIS categorized the banks in the world according to their vulnerability, according to their importance to the world financial system. I've forgotten the exact numbers, but I think we came up with 40 companies that are the banks or insurance companies that needed to be protected and watched over during future crises. So you really see these kinds of developments happening. As to specific U.S. banks, I couldn't really speak to each individual bank, but right. as an overall trend, they are being preserved. You can be sure that in any future crisis, first thing that policymakers do is make sure the banking system survives. It may cost untold amounts of money to do that, but it's so important that they are considered absolutely necessary. But there's much speculation that banks are going to seize depositors holding just to stay solvent. Is this kind of a needless worry? I kind of don't think it is. Potentially it could happen. We'd have to look at the occasion when it happens and what the trade-offs are. And I would question why a bank would do that if we aren't already at the end point. As long as we're not at the end point yet, and this is a task that Satan has as well, mm -hmm. is that he's got to keep this false prosperity ongoing. That's what pulls people into his plan, into his web. And to scare people off, that's not the quickest way to get aligned with Satan and with the anti-money scenario. I'm not sure what tactics are going to be most appropriate at that time, so I have to leave that question open. I do have an email here I would like to read. It's very short. I'm not going to give the person's name. I'd like you to comment on it. And if this is something you're not aware of, we can move on. But she says... I just want to tell you an experience I'm having with a local bank. She says, I live in Missouri. Recently, the bank contacted me about a strange charge on my debit card 
and asked if it was mine. It was not. They immediately canceled that card, which I thought was a good thing. However, they don't have a way to issue a new debit card anymore. The network card printer no longer works. Network wide. Plus, the bank acts like they could care less. So this has impacted my life tremendously. I had no idea how much I often use my debit card. I think this is the craziest thing, and I can't help thinking that I'm getting a small taste of what it will be like when the banking system is completely run by the Great Reset. Did you have any thoughts on this, Wilfred? I'm not familiar with what happened, but I'm sure this is a very sincere writer. It does sound like it'd be a very difficult thing to maneuver through as somebody who has their money accessed through a debit card. But it doesn't sound like a very good business model to me that a bank of some type is that shoddy with customer service. I'm going again here to something that you have written, and I'm going to ask you to expound on it. You say this, essential to the globalist agenda is a final financial entrapment of all mankind to force all to worship the Antichrist. Economic captivity, therefore, plays a key role in the last days. And then you say, A diabolical trap has been set in place. An end-time money snare has been set. You say, how did the world get to this late date, this rendezvous with history? It required a lot of planning and plotting, forward steps followed by backward steps, then again forward. And then you say, the end goal is to entirely entrap humanity, allowing him fewer and fewer options. Ultimately, a stern world ruler will be revealed forcing humanity to comply with his agenda of rebellion. As already mentioned, it is a plot to which the Bible testifies. Then you go on and give the illustration of Joseph. And perhaps you could summarize why you are using the illustration of Joseph, which I think is very appropriate. The trap that we're talking about is described in Revelation 13, 17, where it talks about the limitations of buying and selling. What that really means is no buying of anything anywhere. Complete world financial system is inaccessible. One needs to be approved in some kind of way. The Bible suggests those individuals who do give Satan honor are the ones that then will be allowed to buy and sell. That's the trap. Those individuals who are living inside the tribulation at that point have to make a decision. Book of Revelation in later chapters, 21, 22, tells us more or less what happens to them. And it's terrible, but at least they're the beneficiaries of the first resurrection. This doesn't hit before the tribulation, but certainly we can see all around us. We've commented on a number of items already, Jan, that are emblematic of the end time trends that have to happen. You had mentioned Joseph. We had written an article series on Joseph and him being sort of an example of globalization, if you will. Listeners might be kind of shocked us talking about that because Joseph is seen to be one of the few characters in the Old Testament that has no infractions against them, or wasn't indicated to be a sinner in any great respect. I'm sure he wasn't perfect. So that's a bit of shock that we would use him to model the longer-term development. Right from that point on, Genesis on, using his example of what he did, how he got the power for the Pharaoh, because the Pharaoh ended up being the richest man in the world. He had complete power in terms of financial affairs. Joseph brought the programs that enabled that sort of thing. In the end, at least to that story, is everybody agreed to the policies that they brought about. And they said, we thank you, Joseph, for basically taking our land. We happily give it to you. So you can see how this whole play out happens over time in microcosm there as to what we're going to see playing out over the whole end time era. As we already pointed out, some of these trends are pretty clear. Folks, again, talking to Wilfred Hahn for the hour, because he does have a chapter in the book we carry in our online store, Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm. There are actually 17 contributors. Terry James is the general editor. Some of the other authors include Tim Moore, Pete Garcia, Dave Reagan, Nathan Jones, Tom Hughes, Jeff Kinley, many others. Wilfred Hahn, who's my guest today. So you might want to check that out, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. So Wilfred, I appreciate your time on air with me today. I am down to about a minute. If you'd like to summarize anything, it's all yours. The most important thing I think I'd like to leave with is how close we are in the systemization of the end-time money snare. 
some years ago, we made a tabulation of all the criteria that would need to happen before that could play out in full. Four key steps were involved. And I would say now we're on step number four. And so we were very, very close. The only thing that intercedes for now or hinders are some sovereignty issues. A bunch of nations need to get together and adopt these policies together. And then, of course, the final antichrist has to be there at the lead, bringing about the last few steps here that we already talked about in Revelation 13, 17. So we are close. Much of what we do in this ministry is document those kinds of trends. All of this has played out in less than 100 to 150 years. And that's mm. against the cosmological timeline of human being being on this earth 6,000 years. So for that one little sliver of time, this ferocity of development has happened to the point where we're here right now, steps away from these things starting to play out. Folks, as I go out of the program, I'm gonna say this. Did you know that there are roughly 2,300 verses concerning money in the Bible. That's almost twice as many as verses about faith and prayer combined. Thank you.